The latest webinar from our climate change RPN is getting into one of the most important issues for economists, which is, of course, how we price carbon. So I'm talking today to two of the participants in the webinar about the scientific and the political issues that are helping to determine that price. So hello, Christian. Hello. And hello, Maureen. Hello, Tim. Now, Christian, you start me off. Um, for people who are new to this idea, well, there's not going to be many left by now, but why do we need to assign a price to carbon dioxide? Well, we need, we need to make people internalize the consequence of their actions, in particular actions that generate CO2 emissions. And uh, currently, I mean, they do not take into account of their emission when they decide to use their car or to, uh, to purchase a new one. And the carbon price is a mechanism that forces people to internalize that cost and that realign the private interest with the common good. Pose when you use that logic, there must be one international agreed carbon price by now, Christian. I, what are the range of values we've got? Well, in Europe, we have a market for emission, uh, and the current price on that market is 60 euros per ton of CO2. In France, we have a carbon tax on emissions coming from cars and, and residential, and it's 50, 44 euros per ton of CO2. Uh, we had the yellow vest movement that blocked that tax at that level. And Maureen, what about in North America? What are the prices there? So the Canadian government has a carbon tax on fuels, which is currently $40 per ton of CO2, but it's pegged to go up to $170 by 2030. Uh, the US, alas, does not have a federal carbon tax, but we do calculate the damages associated with a ton of carbon dioxide the social cost of carbon, and we use that to evaluate the benefits of regulations to reduce carbon emissions, such as energy efficiency standards. And the social cost of carbon, um, that's now very low at the moment, isn't it? It's about $50 using the central case estimate per tonne of CO2, so considerably lower than the numbers that Christian was talking about. Yes, absolutely. Now, I believe President Biden, one of the first things he did when he came into office in January was to instigate a revision of this price, this social cost of carbon price. Um, how significant is this revision, Maureen? I think it's very important. I mean, the social cost of carbon is used in the United States by states when they are making investment decisions with regard to the grid and the electricity sector. It's used to evaluate all sorts of environmental programs um, across the US, which are really doing something to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. So I think that the revision here is very important. And I personally believe that the revised number will be much higher. Why do you believe that? What data do they have? What insights do the team have that they didn't have 10 years ago, four or five years ago? So the $50 number is based on, on three integrated assessment models, uh, DICE Fund and PAGE. Uh, when the, the number was first calculated, it was, I would say, um, state of the art, but there have been a lot of uh, improvements in both the climate science, the relationship between emissions and temperature change, and then the damages associated with temperature change. There's been huge changes in both of those literatures since 2010, which was when the social cost of carbon was first calculated. So I believe that both because of updates to what we know about how soon a pulse of CO2 affects global temperature, and because of the huge expansion on damage estimates and uh, well, improvements in damage estimates, I think that this will change the number a lot. Christian, should we be also updating our models now or using completely different models? Well, in fact, I think we should realize that many countries and the international, international negotiation put, push, push countries to, do, to go in that direction. Countries take a quanti quantity target. I mean, they want to reduce their emission by 55% uh, in 2030 compared to 19, 
90, for example, for the European Union, and going to zero net emission by the year 2050. So, so really, the question is not necessarily anymore whether what's the cost associated to the emission, but it's rather what's the price of carbon which is high enough to get to the target. So, for example, if Europe decided to move from 40% reduction to 55% reduction by the year 2030, that means something in terms of the number and the quantity and the intensity of the effort will be left to push to put in order to get to that result and necessarily it means increasing the carbon price and so the question is not necessarily anymore i mean what's the damages how to discount them it's rather uh, what's the price associated to the objective the, the quantity target and that's changed quite radically the structure of the model we need to look at in particular it, it, it push the problem toward examining what will be the technologies that will be available in 2030, in 2050, uh, that will allow us to decarbonize at, uh, at a given cost. And, and so if we believe that tomorrow we will have the technologies to reduce emission at the low cost, maybe that means that we should not increase too much uh, emissions, uh, too, too much, uh, uh, we, should, we, should, we could reduce the price of carbon. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, the issue is, um, uh, how should we take into account the uncertainty associated to, to those future technologies? Of course, if we are sure that those technologies will be, will be there, we should not do too much today and maybe we should reduce the carbon price today. Uh, but but keep, keep in mind that uh, if we move the, the problem from this social cost of carbon problem of, you know, what are the damage to this question of what will be the price in order to get to the target, Typically, we have carbon prices that are much larger uh, than what, do, what were those mentioned by Maureen. Uh, for example, in France, we have a commission that stated that in order to go to the 55% reduction by the year 2030, we should push the price to something like 250 euros per ton of CO2. So it's, you see, it's a different order of magnitude. Maureen, I'm going to ask you a little bit about that discount rate as well. We've seen wildly different discount rates applied, haven't we? It makes a huge difference. Are we settling on a consensus the discount rate should be lower now? So let me answer from the perspective of, of the U.S. Um, the $50 figure is based on a constant exponential discount rate of 3%. This is uh, mandated by the Office of Management and Budget. It's supposed to represent the rate of return on government bonds, um, which have not yielded 3% in the United States in a long time. And there has been a lot of pressure to lower that rate um, to 2%. If you did that and you didn't do anything else in terms of how you calculate the social cost of carbon, it would go from $50 to $125. That is one thing I think will happen. I'm not saying this is the optimal way to discount future climate damages, um, I'm saying what I think might well happen in the United States. So the, really the question raised by Maureen is the following. Do the benefits of reducing emission, do those future benefits, uh, the riskiness, does it look like a, a, a bond return or an equity return? Okay. Depending upon the answer to that question, we should use the rate of return of bonds or the rate of return, ex expected rate of return of equity as a discount rate to, to climate change. And so that's a deep question and, and I should, we should confess that as economists, we have not been very good in examining that specific question, which is critically important in order to estimate the social cost of carbon. Well, there are a huge number of important questions that come into this, that come into the remit of economics on the ethical side as well. Maureen, I'll ask you this. Can a, a common price for carbon be just if it applies to the rich and poor alike, rich and poor people, rich and poor countries? Well, first of all, let me just ask within or answer it within a, in a particular country. Suppose everybody does pay the same carbon price, it's going to generate lots of revenues and you could return those revenues in a progressive fashion. And that is what the Canadian government are planning on doing. 
and in schemes in the U.S., the Baker-Schultz scheme, which unfortunately did not uh, carry the day, the plan was to return the revenues from the carbon tax in a progressive way. Uh, so I think, I mean, I think you do want to have the same price signal go to everybody, but I think what you do to the re with the revenues is very important, and it can certainly they can be returned in a progressive way. How about between countries? So that is a little bit uh, more of a difficult question. Um, and you know, there have been schemes proposed there. Uh, I must say that the concern that it is unfair to ask India, for example, to uh, reduce future of carbon emissions when it really has emitted very little in the past this becomes a very difficult, um, a, a very thorny question. That's, I guess I'm not going to propose uh, what I think would be necessarily a satisfactory answer. Um, perhaps Christian has one, but this is obviously a, a difficult, difficult problem. In theory, we, we should be able to disentangle uh, the problem of uh, sending the high price signal to the people. And here is what you should do uh, and what you will be incentivized to do to reduce emission in order to get to the target at the minimum collective cost. And the question of the allocation of that cost in the population. So the, the, the universality of the carbon price is a condition for getting to the least the, to the least cost solution, the least cost allocation of the effort. And as said by Maureen, we could use the revenue of that uh, price signal and the tax or a market for permit. In both cases, we get revenue, collective revenue. Those one could be used to redistribute. It's relatively easy to, to do it internally within a country. It's indeed much more difficult to do it at the worldwide level. Okay, and we see that in particular, and we will see that at the COP26, uh, the, this, uh, this climate fund that was promised in Copenhagen at the COP21, uh, well, we are still far from uh, getting to the commitment of 100 billion euros per year uh, for a transfer from the north to the south. Christian, if we do not have agreement on carbon pricing, are we going to end up with uh, the idea of emissions being exported? We already have this with pollution, where polluters go to places where the, regula where the regulation is the loosest. So uh, might we have that as well? Could that be a problem? Yes, yes. Well, more globally, uh, if one region of the world decide to do more to penalize uh, emissions, and, and you can do it um, uh, beyond carbon pricing. Uh, if one region of the world do one, have, have a larger, a stronger ambition than other regions of the world, indeed there is this risk of what we call uh, carbon leakages, uh, where uh, the net benefit will be close to zero for the planet because uh, uh, productions of uh, of, of goods and services that uh, are uh, carbon intensive will move from the uh, ambitious region to the less ambitious region. And, and it's a big problem. It's a, and it will be, it's, it has not been so much of a problem up to now because those penalization by the ambitious country has been quite limited, but it will certainly become a, a, a first order problem when uh, the US and certainly Europe uh, will move the carbon price to the level I mentioned earlier that are compatible uh, with the uh, with the 55% uh, the reduction ambition, for example. Yeah, at 250 euros per ton of CO2, it's completely clear that there will be a m many carbon leakages in the system uh, and we need to treat this problem. And one solution to treat this problem is to create a coalition, climate coalition, that's the Nordos argument, or uh, 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 EU proposal uh, that will be discussed this year uh, by the European Commission, which is uh, uh, carbon adjust adjustment, carbon border adjustment. So we will, uh, those more ambitious regions will, will impose the same carbon price 
to the goods and services imported to the region. Thank you very much to both of you because this really is a, a, an interview about everything, isn't it? And um, But I just want to finish us off with maybe a, a, a short answer, a quick answer here uh, about what either of you would really like when it comes down to carbon pricing to come out of COP26. Uh, Maureen, you start us off. Well, it's uh, my fondest hope <laughs> that uh, an international carbon price would come out of COP26. Um, that would be my fondest hope. I'm not holding my breath. Christian? Well, you know, the carbon pricing is not an objective per se. The objective is to reduce emission. And I would leave to the countries, uh, well, I, I would like them to make commitment, uh, a strong commitment to reduce their emission, but that would leave them uh, with the solution how to get there. I, believe, I personally believe with Maureen that the solution for the countries would be to implement the carbon price. But after all, that's the sovereignty and they should decide about what to do. Well, uh, I hope that at least some of your dearest wishes get satisfied. First of all, though, we have the uh, webinar that's coming up in a couple of days' time. Look forward to seeing that. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Finally, just a reminder that the fourth CEPR EAERE webinar on climate policy, which is about carbon pricing, of course, is on the 30th of September 2021. You'll be hearing from Christian and Maureen and also Michael Greenstone. If you want to find out more about the webinar, then use this link. And the link on screen now is to find out more about the activities of the RPN.